see the first uh, poll was done in uh, December 2014, and we were down by 14 points. But we went from here to winning by 24. Um, pretty pretty uh, gratifying result, to be honest. Um, we did that despite the fact that we were out spent $7 million to $39,687.95, <laughs> or 95 cents. So their seven million dollars came from taxpayers. Um, local government put in a, a million bucks. Uh, there was almost six million dollars from TransLink itself. All of that money was taxpayer money. Our thirty-nine thousand six hundred eighty-eight dollars or so was from free will donations. Even more frightening than that, these are the hundred seventy organizations that were on the yes side, and those little you know, ten or twelve there were the ones who ended up with us on the no side. Every union. Every environmental group, uh, every business coalition, business group virtually, uh, every political party, uh, 19 out of 22 mayors, um, yeah, the, <laughs> the provincial government, the opposition, and the Green Party, all of them were on the yes side. We had to take on all these guys. The BC Golf Association was on the yes side. How many of you take your golf clubs on the bus to get to uh, <laughs> the course? Yeah, that's what I thought. And yet, some, for some reason, they decided to, uh, to jump in on this too. So, of course, you know, from an organizational point of view, think of the lists these people had, think of the uh, connections they had, the networks. We had to overcome all of that, uh, all of that problem. So how did we do it? Well, first we did our homework. <laughs> Life is always better with Calvin and Hobbes in it. <laughs> so what happened was, uh, the BC Liberals won an election campaign they were never supposed to win. They were way down in the polls. There was a famous front page of Vancouver Province. And it had a picture of the NDP leader, Adrian Dix. And he's looking right to the camera. And the headline is, this man could kick a dog and still win this election. He was that far ahead in the polls. Um, his vote collapsed. The BC Liberals surged ahead and actually won a surprise uh, by election victory. The next day, uh, I sat down and was looking through the Liberal platform because None of us had really expected them to win, so we focused all this time there to get the NDP. And lo and behold, I came across the Translink referendum promise. I was like, hey, this could be pretty good for us. This is our chance to uh, fight back. So for the next 18 months, until voting started in December 2014, the two groups approached this in very different ways. The mayors, the Translink mayors, so it was a mayor's council, 19 of the 22 mayors who were proposing a new tax. They spent 18 months whining to Christy Clark, the premier, about how unfair this was, how there shouldn't be a referendum, how dare you uh, force us to vote people to get a new tax. They tried letters, they tried motions, they tried everything they could to try to get her to break that promise. But we spent 18 months uh, laying the groundwork to win. We went to work. So during that time, we continued to expose transit waste stories. We had some friends in the media who uh, dug up their own stories. We found that through freedom information requests and all sorts of things. Uh, in that 18 months, I did almost 300 interviews uh, just on Translink alone. We attacked CEO pay and perks. We looked at, um, they announced that we pay freeze, and then we get their pay statements, and it turns out everyone got a raise. That's pay freeze, sign me up. <laughs> uh, you know, all sorts of crazy waste stories that they were doing. We gave them, a, we have an annual award for the worst of government waste, the Petty Waste Awards, it's our signature event. We gave them an award for that. Uh, we highlighted them on our uh, gas tax. So honestly, they, because of course, we're paying these high gas taxes and it's because of TransLink. Just kind of seeding the ground for people, like, there's something about TransLink that's not great. But we also went to work behind the scenes. We hired a campaign manager. So I was you know, the face of the, the No Transit Tax campaign, but there's just no way one person can do everything. And so we brought Hamish Marshall in uh, to help us. Uh, poor Hamish, he, was, you know, he could have gone to work for the other side and made a bunch of money. Uh, obviously, there's seven million tax dollars to spend. He could have picked up quite a few of those, I'm sure. Um, but you know, poor Hamish has a conscience and couldn't be a conscience. You're trying to more money. So he came to work with us. Uh, we wrote a campaign plan. Uh, even before we knew the specific details of the tax, we wrote a campaign plan. The other thing we did is we mined uh, the other side for information. So uh, the great thing about the other side is they had a bunch of forums. You know, they were going to talk about how they were, you know, approaches. How could they win this uh, important vote? You know, what needs to be in the plan for that? And then we put them all online. So I watched hours and hours. 
boards and they're telling me all their secret strategies and all the things that they were going to you know, try to throw at me. And you, know, you just kind of collect this information, right? Uh, when you're when the other side is telling you what they're going to do, listen. It's <laughs> helpful. We built a website. We got all that set to go, and we decided we wanted to be out immediately. Uh, they announced their tax in mid-December. We wanted to make sure that we were the face of the no side. At the time, we thought many other groups and previous fights with Transit would join us. Uh, it turned out we needed a word. It was going to be us pretty much going it alone for the first few weeks. Um, but we wanted to make sure we were the face of that. So uh, on our plan, <laughs> presentations are also better with cat pictures. Too. <laughs> <laughs> it was really good. It was trolling for social media to get some likes here. <laughs> embarrassing, but uh, you, know, you do what you got to do. We had a, a very simple strategy. We didn't get fancy with what we were trying to do. We wanted to make Translink's record without an issue. In these matters, we're about to hand over hundreds of millions of dollars more to Translink to manage, uh, to build infrastructure, to do things with. Um, clearly, they've not done a great job with the money they already had. Um, so you know, why would you double down on a, on a bad organization like that? And our ballot question, this was what we wanted people to be thinking about when they got their ballots through the mail, uh, whatever the tax was, whatever the, the story was worded, however, we wanted them to think in this one sentence, Translink has wasted too much of our money to be trusted with any more of it. Once colorfully, we uh, changed that to uh, uh, Translink, uh, you know, Translink burns so much money, it'd be like giving a power maniac more matches by giving them more taxes. <laughs> this, though, was the key here. Translink has wasted too much of our money to be trusted with any more of it. I must have said that statement thousands of times. I had a friend who uh, who was like, uh, you know, Jordan, it's a good thing I don't drink because if there was a drinking game every time you, uh, you talk about <laughs> wasting money, you know, I'd lose everything. <laughs> the more advanced strategy that we came to was, you know, we wanted to target drivers, not transit users. So know who are, you know, know who is the most right, uh, who's the most right for your message. Who's in the field that you can actually uh, get this message to, and who's going to listen? We wanted to provide an alternative plan for theirs because there are people in Vancouver who do a lot more sky trains and buses. So you wanted to give them a plausible way that that could be uh, done without taking more tax money from them. And then we didn't want to talk about um, we didn't want to talk about the value of the plan. We want to talk about the way the plan was being paid for. So we focused on the taxes, the waste, and that sort of thing. And then we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to a few key ethnic groups in the lower mainland. Um, the, uh, the Chinese vote, uh, specifically in Richmond and Burnaby, is a huge percentage. At one point, uh, a Chinese uh, language radio station had to read a poll with their listeners. 97% of them were on our side. I did a debate once with a mayor at uh, one of the Chinese malls in Richmond for four or five Chinese media outlets carried a lot. And um, it went great. Like, 11 of the 13 questioners were on no side. Uh, the two that weren't were being paid by the other guys to be there. And as I'm leaving the law, I'm being stopped by these lovely families for like selfies. We're going to get a picture of you. And it was uh, the closest I came to being a rock star. Uh, <laughs> I talked briefly there about uh, targeting drivers, not transit users. So in this uh, picture here, the uh, red and purple are a higher percentage of people who use transit to get to work. Whereas the blues are people who, uh, who drive to work. So other than really the downtown area of Vancouver and a little spot in Westminster here, um, this is pretty right ground for us. So we wanted to focus on the suburbs. We wanted to focus on all of these folks here, thinking that we probably would win Vancouver proper. We wanted to make sure that we had all these other, other folks in line. Now, it turned out we did win Vancouver, but that's just because we're so darn good. <laughs> But the big thing Hamish taught me was something called the sword and the shield. If you take one thing away from this, think about the sword and the shield. So uh, I know we all well, you know about the armor of God, but we're going to still way down here, the sword and the shield. Um, the key component to any successful campaign are two messages. One that's an offensive message, your sword, one that you're going to swipe the bad guys with. And one that's your shield, one that will defend you from their attack. Now, in a perfect world, that message would be the same. You know, you can both defend and attack with the same message. For us, we had to have, uh, we had to have two different ones. Um, but it really is the key metaphor uh, for a campaign. So 
So your sword message is the message that you want people to think about when they're casting their vote, or when they're signing that petition, or when your issue comes up, maybe you don't have a vote schedule, but when your issue comes up in the public consciousness, you want them to think about it this way. You know, that's the frame you want them to, uh, to have for that issue. Um, you know, for us, obviously, with that translate was wasting too much of our money. We wanted to, that we wanted that to be ringing in people's ears, so when they got that, that ballot, that's all they thought about. It. And we knew that that would slash it be a whole Many of those mayors have been critical of various translate projects in the past. It's hard for them to flip flop after and say, oh, you know, translate's not so bad, give them more money. Uh, when they've already said in the past that, uh, you know, they've had concerns about it, we wanted to make sure that um, it just, it really puts them on the defense. The shield message was the shield that protected us from their attacks. So we knew from watching um, all these uh, online videos that the other side would say, um, well, you know, the voting over this tax means they have no plan. There'll never be any skyscraper built. We're going to have gridlock and congestion, and the world will end. Um, we'll have to pay false creed. You know, this will all be terrible, all be glorious. We had to have a defensive message. So our defensive message was that there were other ways to pay for, for transit. What we actually had is we got an accountant uh, to put together a 55-page document looking at how by just allocating a little bit of future growth, uh, future revenue growth from city halls, you could pay for the entire plan. So essentially, uh, city halls in the Lower Bayland of Vancouver have been seeing a 5% revenue growth every single year, even during the recession. Must be that. 5% uh, more money every year. If they'd allocated just 0.5% of that 5% to their plan, they could have funded the whole thing. Still good. Um, that day when I would go on TV following the mayor, who would say, oh, Jordan Bateman has no plan, he's just not turning around. I'd say, actually, we have a plan. No tax.ca slash better plan. <laughs> and uh, it just it really undercut or protected us from their, uh, from their slashes. So on our messaging, we want to use the common tongue, not politicians. The great thing on the other side, all that taxpayer money, they had politicians trying to sell the tax. Um, and politicians talk more and more like bureaucrats so long as they're in office. Um, you know, they talk in, they talk with vagueness, right? I mean, you've met with enough MPs and whatnot, and you can kind of, your spidey sense tingles, you know, when um, they're really on side, you know, they're really just parroting back the lines to get you out the door and off to the next meeting. These guys uh, use politicians. We decided that we were going to be very careful about our word choice. So we actually had a list of banned words, words that came to yell at me if I said in public. So I wasn't allowed to say things like transit. Because transit's kind of nice, right? I mean, transit, of course, we all love transit. And we do, we all love transit. I, I'm pro-transit. <laughs> I'm anti-transit. So I never called it transit. It was always transit. Transit, 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 transit. Honestly, I was, it, you know, one, there was one CKNW half hour, I thought I said the word transit like 70,000 times. Like, <laughs> insane about it. We wanted them to connect in their minds. This is what, what this was really about. Uh, they, one of the proposals was for a, uh, a subway to UBC. Well, actually, the subway would stop six kilometers away from UBC, but they were painting it as a subway to UBC. We called that the Arbutus subway. Arbutus is a fancy neighborhood in Vancouver, right? It's like, oh, where the creme de la creme lives. Like, oh, so all of us, you know, poor suckers in Langley are paying taxes so that, you know, the Arbutus subway can be built. Um, <laughs> We never called it Metro Vancouver. Metro Vancouver is the term the politicians use. People live there called the Lower Mainland. We always called it the Lower Mainland. Just subtle things to say, hey, we're with the economy, we're with the people, with these eggheads and the elites telling us what to do. That's crazy about their talking. You know, we're with you. Even their name of the yes sides, um, you know, 150 of those groups got together and formed a coalition. Their, their group was the Better Transit and Transportation Coalition. They were partners with the Transit, uh, Transit Mayor's Council. Uh, even that just sounds governmental, right? Like the Better Transit Transportation Coalition. Who on earth would name something like that? <laughs> uh, we kept it simple. We were no transit tax. So every time we got printed out in the newspaper, you know, said Jordan Bateman, no transit tax spokesman. Oh, no transit tax, no transit tax, no transit tax. Making sure it was getting embedded into people. We also had consistency. So to start with one spokesperson, it was me. Um, we added others as the campaign kind of evolved, but we wanted to make sure we 
set the tone uh, for what was going on. We also want to make sure that the media had someone who they knew was credible on the issue. I've been working on Translate for years, I've been at council before that, dealing with the dumb Translate policies. So they knew uh, that they could call me and trust me. Uh, this was very important. One condiment. The other side had dozens of spokespeople, mayors and the Chamber of Commerce president, the Board of Trade president, all these egos colliding. On our side, we were very simple. And we were nimble. I could just, you know, I talked to Hamish every morning. We kind of lay out uh, you know, what the plan would be for that day. Um, talk to him uh, you know, at the end of every week, we sort of plan the next week out. Quick and nimble. Those four guys were having conference calls with 25 communications directors from Suzuki Foundation and Greenpeace. And, you know, it must have been torture for those people. But they deserve it. <laughs> I did 600 interviews on Translate in, uh, in six months. 600 interviews, the, bus the three busiest months in uh, CTF history for any regional office or even a campaign for me. That's all I did. So the plebiscite finally happened. The mayors decided that they were going to go with a 0.5% sales tax. Uh, the mayors had just safely been reelected uh, a month before, so they felt really powerful, right? Nothing like gets a politician going like a mandate from the people. Uh, of course, none of them had bothered to actually mention that they were planning a tax uh, for transit during their campaign. They conveniently did not get into their campaign re-election brochures, um, but that was what was going to happen. Uh, and then the, the voting went on forever. 11 weeks of voting because, um, I don't know, I think they thought they had so much money that the longer the voting period was, the more they could buy votes. Uh, you know, the more they could, uh, their organizational advantage would be seen. Um, these guys, I mean, they skewed everything. Talk about unfair fight. They wrote the ballot. Their promotional website was on the actual ballot, not on like a piece of paper next to the ballot. No, no. Do you support the mayor's plan? As laid out at you know, Mayor's Council at CA, um, pretty icons. Uh, you know, we couldn't even get, we didn't even have advertising that. The states, what happens with these referendums is we get your side and their side. Both of you get equal space and people can kind of look at it. Never mentioned translate on the document. Um, really, a really unfair things. Skewed the rules to make sure that everything was set up for them to win. So they announced that in December. As I mentioned, we were 14 points down. Uh, in that early December meeting, or mid-December meeting, they also rolled out, I think, the first 50 validators. You know, it's sort of obnoxious to sit there in the crowd and watch the Vancouver Board of Trade gush about how wonderful Translink is, um, and how excited they were to have a sales tax voiced upon their members. Never really understood that. Uh, 19 mayors spoke in favor. Uh, the three political parties came out. But in that moment, we knew that that would be their best day. We knew that whatever the number was of support, that all we were going to do from there on is whittle it down. And uh, yeah, we knew December was going to be their best day, but that uh, better days were coming. And we also knew that we had to get to work. So in January, we decided to roar out the gate. The great thing is these guys spent Christmas on their fancy Mexico uh, trips. They all went away. They shut down all of their offices. Uh, what I did is I finished my thesis for my master's, got everything, you know, we cleared everything off the decks. The website ready, everything was ready to go so that January we would just come storming out of the gate. Because the thing you want to make sure you're doing is you want to make a splash first and early because the quicker you react, or the quicker you get up, the sooner you define the issue, the more likely the issue will be about your, your views on it, not about theirs. So first week of January, we started releasing FOI requests that we've been collecting. Um, Buses in Greater Vancouver have a little button that the driver presses when someone gets on and doesn't pay. So instead of turning them off or you know, having transit security escort them away, you just press the, you know, these drivers instruct them to press the button and let them ride for free. That button in uh, 2013 was pressed 2.7 million times. That was up from 2.1 million times two years before. And it kind of got people thinking about, right, like, if they can't even manage their customers, how are they going to manage their money? We also launched an amazing website, notranslatecax.ca. This is just one slide from it. It's still live, so if you have your mobile phone, I give you permission now to go to notranslatecax.ca and take a look. I won't be offended. Um, but just simple, bite-sized um, things to reinforce the message. How much is this tax going to cost the average family? So we kept the we kept the campaign simple. The two messages, sword and shield, and two numbers. The tax would cost the average family two hundred fifty-eight dollars a year. 
and it can be paid for with this 0.5% uh, allocation of growth. Everything else we try to do is just kind of fall by the wayside. So, you know, how do you spend the money? Uh, you know, this guy is Ian Jarvis, he's the CEO of TransLink. In 2013, he made $468,000. People were kind of really miffed, uh, not so much that he made $140,000 more than the uh, Prime Minister of Canada, because we heard from a few that he was doing a better job than the Prime Minister. Uh, <laughs> typical. Um, I said, yeah, we'll let him rock and we'll see. Uh, but it was like, you know, he was getting $150,000 more than the head of the TTC, the Toronto Transportation. How did people maybe take a step back? They're like, are we really getting this guy? Are we really you know, getting that much more value out of this person? We also launched daily waste of the day awards. So over the years, we've collected 80 different waste stories about TransLink. Many of them have come through the media and reported. I built a running log of that during those 18 months that we were preparing. And every day we put one of these out on the website and on our social media. And these got shared thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And at first with Facebook, we were very careful how much stuff we would put on because we didn't want to deluge people. And we discovered like our core group on Facebook, there's about 3,000 of them at the end, they shared, they would have shared, like we could have posted hourly and they would have shared it out. But they were just rabid on this stuff. They were, you know, they were hard, harder on transit than I was, which is hard to believe. Um, we'd have weeks where we'd have almost you know, a million things shared from three, all starting with 3,000 people. Uh, these little waste of the day, so everyone, uh, everyone got a kick out of those as we as we go one by one. We also decided with social media just one side thing. We didn't set up a new Twitter and have to start from scratch with finding followers. We just used my Twitter. So I already had a relationship with all these media outlets. Uh, it didn't make sense to start a new one. That resulted in a list of very mean tweets about me, some of which are in a, in a book we've written. Um, Hamish insisted on putting them in, much to my uh, <coughs> say. Um, but we did use my Twitter and instead of trying to you know, reinvent the wheel. If you already have a Twitter following or a Facebook following, repurpose it. Don't, you know, don't try to run the parallel thing because it's just one more thing you've got to worry about. We also took advantage of the calendar, literally. It was January, so we released a waste calendar. Uh, 12 stories of transit waste. That is poor thing, the waste hating pig, the uh, CTF mascot. Uh, and you would uh, point to uh, again, like, different pictures with all these different transit waste stories. We released this as a PDF for people to print out, but we printed a limited run for the media, and they loved it. Uh, you know, I sent out the news release in the PDF, and within three minutes, I had an email back from uh, Keith Baldry from, from Global News, who's sort of the big TV guy there. Jordan, send the press gallery 20 copies for this. Uh, even now, I'll go into reporters' offices, or all three hundred and twenty reporters' offices, and there'll be our waste calendar hanging there, right? And one of the things that reminded them, right? Like, okay, these good guys to call and I need a, an anti translate story. Uh, one radio host called it a thing of beauty. Oh my, Jordan's, uh, or the No Transit Impact News Calendar is a thing of beauty. Uh, which uh, we always got to keep up. The best part is, someone's like, it had American dates in it, like the American Independence Day and stuff, because we used a template. Um, and uh, so the, the, the yes sign, like, oh, God, they're using American dates. So I'm like, I think you're missing the point of the calendar. It's not really about the dates, it's more about the thing. <laughs> we just kept pounding away. So this was the uh, coverage from the, uh, the waste calendar. Um, we launched our website at that time. Um, Huffington Post called it one scoop of website, which made um, our uh, web developers heart uh, pitter patter with, uh, with excitement. Um, we just con continued to try to roll out earned media stuff. So we knew the only way to compete was to, frankly, Donald Trump it, right? <laughs> you gotta get that earned media. You know, get them talking, like force the media to talk about you. Because um, there was no way we were gonna compete on the money side. We could not buy the kind of advertising that we would need to keep up with their $7 million campaign. So we had to earn it through hard work, through FOI, through smart releases, through commentaries written by other people who supported us. Um, Step by step. So we tried to make sure we had a couple of earned news media pegs every week. Sometimes, some weeks that was four, some weeks that was one. We tried to make sure to average that to two or three. And then we made sure that we had social media every day and often multiple times a day. That was our better plan. It's not really a book. <laughs> it looks good, doesn't it? Um, and that was our, again, our, our shield message. So I mean, we ran hard in January. And at the end of January, the polling came out. And we had already closed the gap to within four. 
you're already in the margin of error. <clears throat> and the other side started to sweat. And they were really beginning to feel the pressure. Uh, which I say would shake 10 points off the lead already. But the important thing was, our people were a lot more committed to us than their people were to them. Like, when you look at like the extreme, like, never gonna change my mind, uh, something like two thirds of ours were in that count. So we had this great base of support of people who were out there amplifying the message. Um, you know, it was in January that we got our first real person thing. So I get a phone call from a friend of mine. Jordan, do you know the Muffler Man? I'm like, you mean the Muffler Man? <laughs> no, the Muffler Man! You know what's <laughs> next? I'm like, uh, no. He's like, you got to see this. He texts me a picture of this guy's sign. Big sign in Westminster, and all of a sudden, on it is like, don't you translate anymore, like, go translate back to us. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, I love the Muffler Man. <laughs> when we started seeing the people, I went to, uh, well, I didn't go, but a friend of mine, uh, well, I went to check it out after. Uh, a friend of mine sends us a uh, bill from a pub, Jimmy Matt's pub in, in Langley. And on every bill, he started printing, vote no to the transit tax. Oh. Every single bill. And it started to spread among other pubs. Or why? Hey, we're going to take it. <laughs> so February went around, and then we really turned up the heat. Because these mayors, they were sweating and wanted to, to let them take care of them. And what we did is, well, and they also finally got their act together. So in February, they really launched their campaign. By then, of course, the message has shifted. So they do one of the 25 different press conferences, uh, different launches, right? The Surrey groups were all get together, and the Coquitlam groups and all these little launches. It's kind of embarrassing for them, right? Like, how many launches do you need for to actually send a shovel into space? Um, <laughs> so these guys kept watching their campaigns, and um, the media would just grill them on translate. Why don't they hear brochures say translate? Well, this isn't about translate, it's about better transit transit. Well, yeah, the transit's going to spend that money, right? Well, you know, they would do anything to avoid the word transit. But the media had started to adopt our lines and, and started to see that the, the problem <coughs> shifted in the frame of the day. They did crazy things. They had a, a medical expert come out and claim that uh, by voting no, we would increase childhood asthma and cancer rates in the world. We were doing a generation to, uh, to death by asthma. <laughs> they had uh, the fire chief come out. Of course, all of them were reliant on the mayors for their budgets. So they group of four or five come out and tell them that houses will burn down because of more congestion. <laughs> uh, I mean, think of the most congested road you can think of. You still move out of the way for the fire truck, right? Like, give us a break. But it showed how desperate they were getting. Um, you know, poverty groups. Uh, as if the sales tax, you know, it was a regressive tax. This tax would apply to things like oil paper personal toilet and, and things that everyone needs. Uh, it's a regressive tax. Poverty groups coming out and supporting it as if it was some sort of great gift to the poor to tax them more. <coughs> um, so they, they kept going, but we really kept pushing through. So we uh, started using the calendar again, Valentine's Day. We released <laughs> social media like this. A little retro Valentine. Uh, people love that. They were great on Instagram and huge on Facebook for us. Um, we would roll out uh, other voices. There's a guy named Corky Day. And uh, Corky is like, wild. And so Corky uh, was the head of the Green Party of Vancouver, and he decided to break ranks. And he didn't want this tax. So he wrote an op ed called, uh, for a group called uh, Opponents of Unfair Taxes on the Unrich. And Corky's very left wing. And Hamish and I read this thing a dozen times. He did not understand what he was saying. He was speaking in a language that wasn't our language. He was speaking to progressives about why this tax was bad. And you know, I can't believe it. The King Tax Cruise Federation, we put up that we put up that op-ed, written by Corky. Uh, and he spoke to people in a way that we had never done before. And the thing we learned from that was uh, there was no wrong reason for people to vote no. Who am I to talk Corky Day out of, you know, don't vote no because you think it's a tax on the unrich. Vote no because you know they're really wasting money. No, no, if they're voting on your side, let them go. <laughs> they're on your side. Don't try to convince your allies. They're already with you. So we learned that, uh, that lesson there. Uh, I did 160 interviews on Translink. It was in a bunch of lockup. All I did was talk about Translink. Uh, and then we forced them into an error. So, you know, in football, there's, you know, when you put pressure on the quarterback, the quarterback will sometimes make a bad throw. Mm -hmm. This is what happens in errors. 
they uh, fired their CEO. And worse than that, they actually hired uh, a second CEO uh, and got the first one paid. Uh, <laughs> that just reinforced to people that something was wrong at Transom. The other group suddenly felt like they had the space to jump in and help us. Um, that's uh, Ian Jarvis. And by the end of that month, we were up 16 points and we were, just, we were cruising to victory. From that point, we decided, OK, it's tempting. You can change the plan. Unfortunately, the Seattle Seahawks show is why you don't change your plan in the last play of the Super Bowl with your fourth and goal and your best running back in football. Uh, they threw the ball, of course. The uh, Patriots intercepted here and winning the uh, Super Bowl. Um, and the uh, Seahawks uh, faded into oblivion. We were not going to change the plan here at the end. Sorry for you non-football fans, but still works. <laughs> Maybe a Packers fan, but uh, come on. The Patriots, thanks. All right. <clears throat> March came around, the public really got on board and started pushing things through. This is what became clear the spending gap, 7 million versus 40,000. And to the public, just another example of transcendent waste. How come these guys get their rest of 40 grand? You haven't spent 7 million for It doesn't make sense. We released our donor list to that, to show that we had accountability. We're like, Where's your money coming from? Taxpayers. You know, they, at the time, they would not even tell us uh, who was paying what. You know, they sent out, these were some of the flyers that went out to every uh, home in the you know, lower mainland uh, promoting their side. Very pretty, but you notice what's missing from those flyers? People? Real people? I mean, not the flyer we would have done. Uh, you try to make sure our thing is focused back on, hey, it's going to cost you one family $250. We gave them another Teddy Waste Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, this is just a random picture of one of their ways. That is a 20-foot poodle on top of a pole in uh, Vancouver. Um, nothing to do with transit. They just spend 100 grand on a poodle on a pole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> tell them they see. I'm going to show them a picture. We got crowdsourced signs. This was great. So we went up to our, our group uh, and asked them to help us fund some signs. They blessedly funded it up for 800 signs. The lower main line is 2,400 square kilometers. So that's one sign for every three square kilometers. So clearly we weren't doing this to, uh, to be seen everywhere. But we made a bet. We figured that the mayors were so angry with us that they would instruct their bylaw officers to tear down our signs. <laughs> and that the public would hate that. Well, mission accomplished. <laughs> they, <laughs> tore they tore down our signs. This is the front page of the Surrey Leader, which is the second biggest municipality in the area. We were on the front page of one of our supporters in the Tri-Cities, uh, which is uh, three of the big communities on the north side of the river. Uh, we were on the Global News Hour with this. Way more people saw these pictures than ever saw a sign in real life. <laughs> <laughs> and then the day of the voting started. And the front page of the uh, Vancouver sign, as everyone's weighing their balance in, look at that. We're going to, we're 22 points up. Angus Reed, another company did a poll, we found it was even higher than that, 62 to 27, there's 12% on the side. Those 12% were like people who wanted to say yes, but you're lucky to get paraded by the neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and the front page of the problems, remember what our, our sword message was, right? Voting against trans, like trans is not mentioned on the ballot. Everyone knows what this vote's really about. So that's, I mean, of all the things, of all the visuals we've been using, this one to me is the one. You know, I love the most. <laughs> it's the one that I have printed out in my office because it reminds me that you know years, months of work can culminate in the message shifting. Uh, Vancouver said also this story of transit volunteering for the west side. <laughs> not surprising. Uh, in the polling that was done during that period, 61% echoed our message. I mean, even the pollsters were using our exact wording, right? Like, you don't want that. That's the reason why they voted against it. Um, this was a personal favorite because apparently the only way that the other side could have won is if I if I defected. So that's always good. <laughs> yeah. What if David had gone over to the field soon? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final Angus people asked who's been the most persuasive in this vote. So we see Premier Clark weighed in there six percent, you know the business groups at sixteen, the mayors, uh, unions, think of the seven million dollars those agencies make, and the little old us. 37%. There was this guy, um, and uh, I'm at uh, Surrey Central Station uh, for a photo op with a newspaper. And I got my earbuds in, sitting on a bench behind me so we can't see him for that show. And the yes side had started paying these very uh, bright young people to go and uh, sign up supporters at, at Transit Station. Uh, so this 
very uh, nice thing. Girl comes up to this guy, it's all beard. He's got this big beard. He's like, big dude. And she's like, um, sir, are you going to vote uh, yes to the, to the transit tax? And this guy goes on like a blue streak, words he cannot possibly say. And he's like, I hate that bathroom, Jordan Bateman, and that Canadian Taxpayers Federation, but gosh darn it. And so, if he isn't right about this, I'll never vote for that tax. And I'm sitting right behind him as he's yelling about how much he hates me. Like, I'm dying laughing. We should have recorded this conversation because no one would believe it. Uh, so the girl's like, okay, well, but you have to know. And like, scurries off. Yeah, I didn't have the, I didn't have the best interview. Throughout the vote, we released uh, videos um, trying to kind of keep the energy going over those 11 weeks of voting. Um, we kept pushing on you know, waste issues, anything we could do. But we also didn't take any risks. So, our in case of an emergency break glass plan was to have a big rally. We needed to show that we had momentum or something. We were going to do a big rally. Of course, the downside of the big rally is what the shows up. You know, what if you can only get 200 people in um, The great thing is the momentum <coughs> shift to the point where we did need to do that. So, so we ended up skipping that, um, although it would have been a heck of a lot of fun for sure. Uh, <coughs> the other side actually had sophisticated voter ID that were phone banks, phoning people. We couldn't do that, so we had to really rely on people to be self motivated. That was really kind of the thing that was, Since they tore down all our signs, we crowdfunded for a banner to be flown over the Vancouver Marathon. No voter trans on cast. We wanted to fly it for uh, three hours. Uh, we raised enough money to do that, a couple grand. Um, we then uh, said, okay, we'll do a fourth hour, we said 200 bucks for that. And then I get to the, uh, I call the pilot to arrange it. And he's like, oh, Jordan, I just had uh, someone call me with his visa. He's bought you two more hours of flight. <laughs> so then I'm having six hours for a marathon. We're kind of tweaking the media loved it. They came and filmed with plane taking off. <laughs> <laughs> You do what you got May the 4th is Star Wars Day. So, you know, we're going to get into a few If you've never seen Star Wars, you're like, man, this guy's nuts. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> we're a movie from 1977. All right. You might want to get on that. In the end, we won everywhere. So, voter turnout was just under 1%. We lost three tiny municipalities. Um, but even Vancouver uh, voted. Uh, voted no, which I thoroughly enjoy when Gregor Rocks and the mayor of Vancouver, his people, um, no claim I don't speak for Vancouver, I was just uh, tweeting that 5149. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and uh, this is one of their, one of their yes leaders says to the National Post, uh, he was very upset, poor Gord. Uh, in Gord they trust, uh, not mm -hmm. so much, but mm -hmm. we slayed the Green Dragon as some did. And the, the slaying the dragon is a thing in Vancouver because uh, when the Canucks in 2011 finally defeated the Chicago Blackhawks after losing them two years in a row, the, the iconic radio call is, you know, Earl Scorby slayed the dragon! So this is like a big <laughs> meaning for people in Vancouver. Unless you're from Vancouver, never been hockey, in which case you're thinking like, <laughs> I think he's digging too deep into the metaphor there. <laughs> so what we did right, very quickly, we laid the groundwork. Uh, we hired a campaign manager. So you need you can't do it alone. You need someone to talk to about these You need someone to bounce ideas off of. Um, Hamish and I had to bounce ideas off of each other. We stuck to the message. We didn't stray into all the other stuff. I didn't do anything but translate for those six months, which is very rare for the CDF. You know, we usually do many stories on many issues at once. Uh, in fact, it took me about three or four months after the vote to start to collect enough stuff to start talking about other issues again. That's how focused we were on translate. And we were quick. We also didn't feed the social media trolls. Don't waste your time on people who are angry, bitter, and never going to agree with you. Mm -hmm. I muted 200, 250 people during that campaign. Not people who had a genuine disagreement or wanted to talk about it, but people who were just calling you names. Don't bother. Start with it. Lock them. Muting is better because they can't see that you muted them, so they have no idea that you're still <laughs> talking. I love the idea of these people in their mom's basement somewhere <laughs> spewing hate at you, and they don't even really know what to do. Only if you go to the uh, if you're really hardcore into social media, and okay, you're feeling a lot of criticism, go to Roberto Luongo, the uh, Florida Panthers goalies Twitter feed. <laughs> there is no one better on the planet at managing Twitter trolls than at Strongbone One. He, uh, he does it with humor and aplomb, and there were many times on Twitter I thought, what would Roberto Luongo do? <laughs> 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 oh, what would Roberto do? Um, you know, there was one lady who uh, 
said something negative about trans, and so I thought she was with us, so I favorited her tweet. And then she tweeted out, uh, oh no, Jordan David just favorited my tweet, I feel so dirty. So I favorited that one too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then she tweeted, well, at least he has a sense of humor, but I favorited that one too. <laughs>